Hi again, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining. Um, as usual, we're going to start with a, a prayer. I want to um, upload the, uh, just to show you the um, presentation, you can follow. So earlier today, uh, Tavo is my baby, is here on the right side, my toddler, and uh, he had a friend coming over from his uh, kindergarten, uh, and uh, they were hanging, having, like having fun, hanging out, watching the view. Uh, what you don't see really in the picture here, but it's uh, I can actually see the parliament from where I live, just to see kind of like a little piece of the parliament. And uh, I think we're all uh, looking up uh, to our uh, leaders uh, to do whatever necessary to uh, get us out of this uh, situation, and so does the younger generation. Um, yeah. So uh, Psalm 4. And you can follow, of course, the English. I'm going to read it uh, in Hebrew. We're going to pray for... Uh, uh, those who are captured in Gaza, uh, especially the children and children and the babies that are captured over there, women, uh, the elders that are captured over there. Uh, I hope God will have his mercy on them and uh, make sure those who capture them treat them in the most humane way and ultimately uh, release them. And uh, we pray for them, we pray for uh, the wound, the injured, the people that were injured. We're praying for um, those who died and uh, uh, may their soul be elevated to heaven and uh, their family will have uh, comfort. And we're praying for our soldiers to um, finish uh, uh, the enemy and destroy the enemy as fast as possible. Uh, so let's start. Lam natzeach ban ginot mizmor David. בקורי ענני, אלוהי צדקי, בצר הרחבת לי, חנן ושמע תפילתי, בני, בני איש, עד מי כבודי לכלימה, תאבון ריק, תבקשו חזב סלע, הודעו כי הפלא אדוני חסיד לו, אדוני ישמע בקורי אליו, רגזו ואל תחתהו, אמרו בלבבכם על משכבכם, ודומו סלע, דיווחו זכי צדק, ובטחו אל אדוני, רבים אומרים, מי יראנו טוב, נשא עלינו אור פניך, אדוני, ואתה תתה שמחה בלבי, מעת דגנה ותירושם רבו, בשלום יחדיו אשכבה וישן, כי אתה, אדוני, לבדד, לבטח תושיבני. photos and uh, uh, don't know all of them in person, uh, of course, but uh, just uh, exciting photos uh, of our heroes, uh, such as uh, this soldier that is holding his weapon, he's uh, in an armored vehicle just next to it. And um, it's hard to see it from this picture, but he's uh, studying the, the Jewish law, the Talmud. And um, if you know how a Talmud page looks like, this is not the easiest thing to read and to concentrate when you are in the border with Gaza. Uh, we talk about a lot of complicated discussions and debates uh, that are taking place over there. Uh, requires a lot of concentration, and uh, well, that's what he's doing. Yeah, doesn't waste any minute. Uh, just waiting idle. He's uh, learning the word of God. This. Uh, a, Lieutenant Colonel Alim Abdallah Saad. He's a Druze person. He was killed yesterday uh, in uh, the southern part of Lebanon, uh, in the border with Lebanon. Uh, as maybe some of you noticed uh, on the headlines, we are starting to see Hezbollah waking up. Um, let's hope it won't escalate uh, because uh, the capabilities of Hezbollah are far worse than uh, Hamas. And um, that's why we have so many reservists, uh, hundreds of thousands of reservists uh, were called, uh, including my neighbors. Um, 
So this is uh, the situation right now. Okay, so uh, another lady that uh, I think you should know of is uh, Inbal Rabin Lieberman. And um, uh, she was uh, from a kibbutz called Nir Am. And uh, as soon as she woke up and understood that something is uh, happening, she was uh, organizing the, um, the volunteers that are the armed volunteers in the kibbutz and organized them and set them all the men in ambush in the different fences and different parts of the kibbutz. And uh, none of the uh, terrorists actually made it into the kibbutz. They all were killed on the fence, uh, 25 terrorists. And uh, she was really uh, in command over there. So that's uh, me and uh, our heroes. Hey, I want to show you uh, photos from Jerusalem. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, right now in Jerusalem. Um, we don't have too many sirens, really. God's willing, it will stay this way. Uh, um, the streets are pretty quiet because there is no school. So uh, there's nothing, people don't work from home or work part-time, so there's, uh, there's no traffic. It's pretty quiet in the streets. Um, and uh, as I was uh, just uh, getting a few more stuff uh, from uh, the grocery stores and this and that, uh, I noticed uh, this graffiti, it says uh, to annihilate Gaza. Uh, I would say it, um, it reflects the feeling of uh, many Israelis um, from all the spectrum, left and right. Uh, and uh, sadly, there is a, a very strong sentiment uh, to, that this is going to be the last Gaza war in a way. Um, it seems like the Israeli uh, public won't accept any other round of violence with Gaza. Uh, so um, I think on one of the first days, I'm not sure if I discussed it really. Um, uh, I would say this, that um, it probably doesn't matter which government will be in charge, whether Netanyahu stays, whether they will have uh, some kind of a wider government with other opposition parties that will join the government. They're almost in all political constellations, oh, I, that's how it seems like, um, there will be a military uh, invasion into Gaza by the Israeli Defense Force. And uh, the results are going to be catastrophic. I'm just uh, preparing you mentally for uh, the horrors you're going to hear from uh, Gaza, um, from the Palestinian side, as the an Israeli army moves in a very, very densely populated area uh, in order to uh, um, kill the Hamas terrorists. Um, it's going to be catastrophic. And one of the reasons is that um, the uh, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad deliberately use the civilians as uh, human shields. Uh, they don't allow them to leave Gaza into Egypt. Uh, they, 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 they just don't allow it. If you're trying to escape, trying to go away, uh, they, I understood, I didn't saw it on the news, but a friend told me that they uh, uh, shot uh, towards the border with Egypt, uh, including launching a few, um, a, not rockets, but uh, uh, mortar, mortar shells, mortar rounds uh, to uh, that area. Uh, just to make sure uh, people don't go to Egypt, don't escape to Egypt, because again, that's part of the um, theater from hell that they are uh, preparing uh, for, the, for the world, really, to see. They want the dead civilians, they want to, uh, the world to see civilian casualties on their side. That's really a part of their strategy for the last, I want to say, 25 years, probably. So this is, um, again, that's what's happening. So this graffiti was really standing, standing out, like I don't think I ever saw something like that in Israel. Uh, so I want to say a word about that. Uh, yesterday, there was a rocket launched uh, to um, Jerusalem area, to the Judean Hills in the afternoon, uh, and it hit uh, an Arab village called Abu Ghosh. It's a very interesting uh, village. I mentioned it uh, yesterday. It's one of the places that are considered to be um, a mouse of the New Testament, where Jews appear to two people and then dined with them. So uh, there is a ancient church over there. It's a very interesting place. So uh, a rocket uh, hit uh, this mosque. What you see here is the great mosque of Abu Ghosh, 
you can really see it when you just go on the road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, you can actually see it uh, as you drive by. And uh, I understood that, I, I don't know about casualties, I understood that a uh, few women and children were injured. So uh, that's uh, from yesterday. Um, there's a lot of criticism in social media against the government uh, that are, is very famous for uh, being very outspoken, uh, very much on Twitter and TikTok and all that, uh, has everything to say all the time. And then now that uh, we have this catastrophe uh, upon us, uh, everyone's hiding under the table. No one is uh, going out to the public. No one's, everyone's like making these excuses, blaming other people, blaming the army, blaming this, blaming that. Uh, so there's a lot of criticism. Again, this is from one of the newspapers, but um, uh, you can actually see it in the on social media uh, in Israel. So this is a uh, part of the public sentiment that uh, I uh, share with you. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm stopping here. Um, for uh, this is the updates. Uh, then um, I want to say a word about. Uh, I want to teach you something from the Torah uh, and. Um, not sure exactly how it's going to work, but I want to take you on a quick uh, virtual tour uh, that resonates, like connected to uh, the verse that I'm going to talk about. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you, James, for uh, joining in. Um, so again, thank you all. If there are any questions uh, at this point, I'll be happy to answer. I assume that some of you cannot stay for too long, so uh, you guys are welcome. If you want to stay, uh, stick a little longer um, for the Torah study, then you're welcome. Would Egypt leave, let uh, civilians uh, in? Um, Yes, as long as they are not connected to Hamas, I'm not sure exactly how they would know, but they have their intelligence. But that's something that I understood from uh, from an actual professional. I, I, I usually, I think he mentioned that I don't really watch the news. I get news uh, from different sources, but um, trying not to expose myself to um, too much news. I, I also advise uh, you the same. I have people that I talk with, people that are in involved and and uh, trying to minimize my exposure because uh, the atrocities that are, are being told happened uh, during the uh, Hamas invasion and what we're going to see next it's going to be horrific uh, this is ISIS style uh, act I mean I don't have any other words I I will leave it this way uh, I don't want to be graphic uh, will, Israel, will Israel have to occupy Gaza in the long term to neutralize Hamas? Um, it's a good question, James. This is the type of debate that was going on in that military political echo chamber for the last uh, 10 years or so. What should we do with Gaza? Should we reconquer it? And what, what should we do? I remind you, Israel withdrawal from Gaza in 2005 uh, and evacuated uh, about 8,000 settlers, uh, Jewish settlers that lived over there in some couple dozen uh, settlements. Uh, and the idea uh, of Ariel Sharon, the prime minister, was um, that uh, if one bullet will go from Gaza into Israel, that will be their end. Of course, uh, since then, we have the, uh, I don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of rockets and uh, whatever, uh, whatnot, uh, since then. And people don't really know what to do with Gaza. It's a pocket of terror and um, uh, incitement against Israel. There are two thirds of the population is uh, Palestinian refugees and their descendants, meaning they it's really embedded in them uh, that uh, Israel uh, took their lands and villages and they want to go back to Jaffa, they want to go back to the different villages uh, of the southern coastline of Israel that are in, in, in Israel proper. Uh, so there's a lot of um, boiling lava over there for 75 years, since 48. Um, so the debate in Israel many, for many years now uh, is what should we do? Like there is a terror organization ruling there since 2007. And uh, they just uh, growing an army over there. And um, 
what um, Netanyahu's plan was for many years. He's in office since 2009 with a small inter intermission uh, last year. Um, his idea was that as long as we have uh, the political entity of the Palestinians divided between the West Bank that is ruled by the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, which is ruling uh, Gaza, as long as we have that, we don't really have to negotiate uh, for peace agreement and all that and have concessions and all the rest. Okay, that's, that's the paradigm he had. Um, so in a way he, and not in a way, he deliberately nurtured Hamas a, and uh, made sure it's strong enough so that no negotiations will have to be initiated. Um, and now, of course, everything is blowing in our face. Many people warned, like, we're really growing another Hezbollah over there. And uh, now, of course, everything is exploding in our face. Um, uh, this part of them, of course, uh, failed. And, um, and the question was, OK, should we just go in, occupy it, and actually rule it, like Israel had a military rule between 67 and uh, 1990. Um, I guess four or five, something like that, somewhere over there. Uh, there was a direct military rule of Israel, and then uh, the Palestinian Authority was established in 93, and the Israel started to uh, allow Yasser Arafat at the time to rule Jericho and uh, Gaza, and then later other areas in the West Bank. So what should we do? Should we actually control Gaza directly, like we had until 90, somewhere in the 90s, or um, should we just go in, destroy the military branch of Hamas, which in practice means that we are destroying the entire um, the entire Gaza Strip, and then pull out? So if we withdraw after just destroying the military, the mil killing the militants, destroying the infrastructure that is relevant for Hamas um, military operation, if we do that, okay, who's going to rule over there? Uh, so the debate is that. If we just leave that vacuum, it, there are crazier, surprisingly, uh, even crazier people than Hamas in the Gaza Strip, even more fanatic than them. Islamic Jihad, way more militant, um, uh, Hizb al Tahrir, there's like, uh, all kinds of bodies, uh, all kinds of organizations that are very, very radical. And uh, if we leave Gaza and allow, the, allow these terror groups, uh, which uh, somehow could be even more radical than Hamas uh, to be in power or to have all kinds of gangs fighting between them. We, so we are just leaving a vacuum and there'll be chaos over there and this chaos clearly gonna seep into Israel. So no one really had a straight answer, what should we do? Uh, and I guess um, uh, if this debate was ongoing and uh, in a way Netanyahu kind of postponed the answer to that debate, like just postponed it and now it's uh, exploded uh, in the most horrific way. So um, a, that's a long answer to what James asked. Will Israel have to occupy Gaza in the long term to neutralize Hamas? So um, we don't have the answer for that. That's the big question of Israel over the last 10 years. Direct military rule? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I don't think the Israelis are interested in that. Um, what other formula? I really don't know. Um, and uh, Egypt won't be interested in ruling that part of the world. Uh, I, yeah, let's see, I'll, I'll try to uh, see what the Egyptians think about it. I know in the past they offered uh, that the Palestinians will actually move into Sinai and get a much wider territory actually, uh, but uh, I'm not sure exactly where it stands now in the discourse over there. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? James, uh, sorry it was long, but you asked a very loaded question, so I tried to break it. Anything else, my friends? Again, uh, after that, I want to move to the uh, Torah studying. I want to. I also want to show you the Hamas Charter. So uh, stick around; it will be interesting. Uh, we'll have another Q&A Q &A, uh, as uh, we go. So uh, let me just um, <coughs> share my screen again. Okay, uh, you're supposed to see the verses of Deuteronomy 25. Can you see that? Yes, 
Okay, good, thank you. Okay, um, in uh, the Torah, there is um, a commandment to perform genocide. Uh, God is ordering the people of Israel to perform a genocide uh, to a certain tribe or nation, I guess, uh, called the Am Amalek. Amalek. Okay, that's how it's called. Let's read the verses. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. The weakest people are in the back. They had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you, in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, he shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Okay, so what God is actually saying here. God noticed the people of Amalek attacking the children of Israel in the desert, a nation of until recently slaves, um, not trained, not armed. Uh, they were enslaved in Egypt for like 200 years. And now they are out and they're being attacked. And who's going to, who are they attacking? The Amalekites, who are, they are attacking the people that are lagging behind, the weakest of the weakest of the tribes of Israel. Um, just as a side note, uh, the tribe of Dan is walking in the back, okay? As the ch children of Israel are uh, walking in the desert, the tribe of Judah is on the lead, and the tribe of Dan is in the back. Um, so he sees that, and then God is obeying the children of Israel. And this is Deuteronomy. They're still somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, Transjordan. They're like Mount Nebo kind of area, okay? Um, they're not even in Israel, okay? But when the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies, meaning after all the wars of Joshua, and after all the wars of the book of Judges, meaning um, 400 years approximately, we're talking about 400 years after that event happened. Not yesterday, not last year they attacked us, we're going to revenge. 400 years later, God is telling you, you're going to smash them. You're going to uh, annihilate them. Okay? That, that's basically what God is commanding the children of Israel. Now, you don't see it in, here in these verses, but uh, later in the book of Samuel, he says that um, uh, you should not spare women, children, cattle, should kill their cattle as well. They're all they have, all they have, and you must not take any uh, booty. You must burn completely all their possessions. Don't leave anything Don't. that belongs to the Amalekites. And uh, later in the book of Samuel, uh, things are getting complicated. Uh, basically, uh, King Shaul, King Saul, the first king of Israel, um, he attacks the Amalekites, but he allow their king to survive. Uh, the name of the king is Agag. It's a strange name. That's his name, Agag. And um, he spares his life. But later, Prophet Samuel will understand what happened that they were not really annihilating the Amalekites as, as they were supposed to. They left the cattle, they left some booty. So basically, Prophet Samuel himself kills Agag. And Saul, King, Sh King Shaul, King Saul, he's, he, he can't be the, the king of Israel anymore from that point onwards. Later, King David will finish the job, basically. And uh, we'll see now. I want to share with you um, Google Earth. I want to show you um, a few points. I want, I want to try and make sense out of this. Uh, not make sense, but I want you to have some geographic context to this story. Okay, so uh, it's part of a whole, um, uh, one second, remember. Okay. Strange. Okay. 
okay I don't know why it doesn't work but uh, anyway we'll deal with that so it's a part of a virtual tour I gave about Purim the book of Esther and uh, the attack of the Amalekites was in Sinai okay somewhere over here so just this is Egypt Cairo okay, the Nile River the children of Israel are crossing the Red Sea uh, there are a few speculations where exactly they crossed uh, we have uh, Mount Sinai, St. Catherine uh, over here, the high mountain of uh, Sinai over here, the high mountain of the peninsula of Sinai. Okay, and uh, after that, the children of Israel are just wandering in the desert, and uh, ultimately, uh, they will, at the beginning, they try to cross uh, from a certain place, Shu Road, and they were attacked. And then later, uh, uh, the story goes and Shaul basically kills the Amalekites and uh, uh, destroy the Amalekites in the same area in this Negev desert area and um, David will finish the job basically but something happened something happened and we hear about the Amalekites once again in a very different context we hear about them in Iran in Persia that's basically the, the book of Esther. That's what it's all about. Okay, uh, the book of Esther speaks about a man called Haman, which is an advisor of uh, the Persian uh, king uh, Xerxes Hashverosh. And the name of uh, Haman is Haman, son of Hamata, the Agagite. Okay, it's like really in the book of Esther, the Agagite, meaning the one from the descendants of Agag, okay, Agag, again, that Amalek uh, king, okay, so uh, what I'm showing you over here, Shush, Shush, that's uh, Shushan, Shushan that is mentioned in the book of Esther, uh, the story of Purim is basically happening over there in the southern part of, uh, or southwest part of Iran over here, uh, so that's uh, what you see here. So uh, as far as the Bible concern, we have this war against the Amalekites since the Exodus, then the first kings of Israel, then just at the beginning of the second temple period, meaning the first temple was destroyed by Babylon, then 70 years later there are the returnees uh, uh, from Babylon and uh, they are returning from Babylon, but the political power is actually in Persia. Okay, so uh, as the children of Israel are approaching back to their land, okay, whether it's for the first time after, during the Exodus or the second time, those who return from Babylon, Amalek um, strikes. Now, the interesting part about the Amalekites is that they always strike as Israel is on their way to their land, okay? Remember that. So the first time it happens is the Exodus. The children of Israel are going from Egypt to Israel, Amalek attacks. In the days of the second temple, the children of Israel are returning from Babylon, okay? And then Haman attacks, and he wants to basically have a Holocaust against the Jews. Again, it's in the book of Esther. In the 1930s and 40s, another Amalek arise in Germany in Germany so um, a, in Jewish thought okay it's like modern Jewish thought rabbinic thought okay uh, some over here it was the bunker of Hitler I, I've been I've been there but I can't remember exactly I just I remember being there uh, I so it's this parking lot somewhere like I remember there's some kind of a plaque or something maybe this area uh, the bunker of uh, uh, Hitler in Berlin. So once again, 1930s, 1940s, the children of Israel, the Zionist movement already started decades earlier in the 19th century. The children of Israel are on their way back to the modern state of Israel. And then again, in the Jewish thought, okay, um, a person like Hitler attacks, Amalek attacks. So in the Jewish thinking, the Nazis are considered to be uh, at least the spiritual descendants of Amalek, okay? Uh, what we see now in Gaza is uh, 
atrocities, just horrific. Uh, again, I'm saving all the graphics. I, I try not to expose myself to it either, but I'm just telling you, it's ISIS level. Uh, and um, one should wonder, and I'm just, it's, it's just my thought, okay? Uh, whether all the demonstrations and all the um, tensions in Israel itself, which in the basic part of it is about the identity of Israel. How do you balance Jewish democratic values? How do you balance the Jewish democratic state in such a way that we keep our values, we keep our loyalty to God and to his Torah, and on the other way, we keep our precious democratic values at the same time? How do you do that? This is really what the public debate was over here. And um, as we are debating our identity, so in a way, Israel is transforming now to a more um, sophisticated guess, I guess, a sophisticated way uh, to identify itself. As we are morphing, Amalek attacks. Okay? Uh, I guess uh, the new Amalek, uh, I mean Hamas, um, he saw that, of course, as a point of weakness. He saw all the Israelis uh, fighting against each other, a lot of political tension. Uh, for those who live in Israel know that it's not like America at all. It, nothing like it, okay? Um, it's really nothing. It's not polarized like uh, in America. It's, it's a very different type of discourse. Um, and um, I would say that uh, it, Hamas estimated from what he sees, oh, they're so polarized, they're so divided. The reservists say to Netanyahu, we won't show up. We don't want to uh, participate in your army. Uh, we won't serve uh, because uh, of the judicial uh, reform uh, you're promoting. Okay, uh, all of that. And Hamas saw that as weakness. He doesn't understand how the Jewish discourse really work. Uh, I mentioned the Talmud earlier, the guy that was studying the Talmud. The Talmud is furious battles and debates between uh, rabbis. But there is a principle in the Talmud that all the words of the rabbis over there, all their opinions on all their un understanding of the text is the living word of God. Divrei Elohim Chaim. Okay, now, um, the whole idea, and it's coming from the book of Psalms, this idea that God has spoken and I've heard two things. Okay, it's really in the book of Psalms. Um, this whole idea is that in order to understand truth, the truth of God, the truth about uh, our existence here, you need to have multiple opinions. That's why debate is encouraged in the Jewish uh, tradition uh, since forever, pretty, pretty much. But Hamas saw that as weakness. He, I, I'm, I will have to ask them. I'm not sure if they'll be alive at that point. But um, I don't think they expected that the Jews in Israel will unite in 12 hours and 300,000 reservists will show up. I, I don't know what they thought, okay? But uh, that's actually what happened. So uh, that's, uh, again, what I want to share with you about uh, Amalek, okay? Um, for those who need to leave, no problem. Uh, there is, a, a, let's give a few more minutes for Q&A if any of you needs to leave and want to ask about that part. The last part, I wanna show you a Hamas charter just so you know what we're dealing with. So uh, you're welcome to ask. Anyone? Itama, yeah? is, is there any reaction from Saudi Arabia? Uh, I didn't follow a... I'll touch it real quickly, if you don't mind. Um, the, the, one of the reasons, at least one, okay, of the reasons why all of this is happening now is the fact that uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, relationship is warming up. And uh, uh, let's say if that didn't happen, there's a good chance that during this year, uh, we'll have a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that really, really worries uh, the Iranians, okay, the Ayatollahs in uh, Tehran, it's really worrying them. 
uh, for many good reasons, uh, geopolitically, strategically, economically, there's, it's going to affect them in a, in a negative way. You know. It's not another Arab country that has peace agreement with uh, with uh, with Israel. It's not uh, Bahrain or uh, the United Arab Emirates, which are uh, new uh, allies of us, uh, new uh, peace partners. Uh, this is Saudi Arabia. This is like 300, uh, sorry, 30 million people. Uh, this is um, the biggest uh, oil producer probably in the world, uh, or or maybe second to America, but still very important in the global market. Um, it's the cradle of Islam. Okay? It's where Mecca is. It's where the prophet buried. Okay? So if um, Saudi Arabia has a peace agreement with Israel, uh, then practically there is nothing to stop the dam from collapsing. This dam that blocked, I would say, the Arab world from having a um, peace agreement with Israel. So Egypt started that in the 70s, later uh, the Palestinians in Jordan, the 90s. The Palestinians, it's not exactly a peace agreement, but it's a peace accord. But uh, anyway, um, that really helped. And then now with the Abram uh, Accords and uh, the peace with Saudi Arabia, that would really open pff, the entire uh, Muslim world, Arab world and Muslim world uh, to Israel. We talk about 20 something Arab countries, almost 60 Muslim countries around the world. So um, they had to do something about it. So not sure exactly how uh, Tehran and Gaza and Lebanon, uh, all that, all these headquarters of Hamas, how exactly they coordinate the timing of it. I don't have information about that, but uh, they, they're sure not happy with the Saudis uh, getting to us. Did they declare something? I, I didn't check. Maybe they condemn, but I didn't check. Uh, but uh, the Saudis are really looking at what's happening. And uh, I don't think they're reevaluating their will to have a relationship with Israel. I don't think so. That's what Tehran wants them to do. But it's just, again, it changes the timing of when exactly they're going to do that, when exactly they're going to warm their relationship and have it not under the table, but over the table. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Anyone else uh, before we move to uh, the last part? Okay. Uh, okay. So um, what I'm showing you here is Hamas Charter. I actually advise you to read the entire thing. Um, Hamas Charter, Hamas Covenant, okay, you can just find it, uh, I just found it here in Yale Law School, okay, whatever. I read it in Arabic, so uh, I know it, it's it's fine, the translation. Um, so I, I just wanted to be familiar with the, that this document actually exists, and um, I want to look at a few of the articles. It's it's pretty mind-boggling uh, if you read the whole thing, but if you, if you don't, then I'll just want to show you a uh, few uh, articles, okay? So uh, in the Hamas Charter, of course, they say they are part of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which is a very radical um, uh, Islamic um, uh, organization starting somewhere in the 1920s in Egypt. And um, let's uh, look at uh, Article uh, 6, okay? So we have the introduction, then we have all kinds of articles, and they're all very interesting. But uh, I'll just point out a few, okay? So um, Article 6 says, the Islamic resistance movement is a distinguished Palestinian movement whose alliance is to Allah and whose uh, way of life is Islam. It strives, pay attention, it strives to raise the banner or the flag of Allah over every inch of Palestine, okay? For under the wing of Islam followers of all religions can coexist in security and safety where they where their lives uh, possessions and rights are concerned okay so what we see is classic in islamic thought it's really just a mainstream islam i would say the idea that uh, there is a dar el islam okay there's the house of islam there are the territories controlled by uh, islam and then there is the dar al harb the house of war or the territories that are owed to be under to come under islam okay 
Uh, and uh, that's what you see here. They wish to have the flag of Allah uh, over every inch of Palestine. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, it's just a matter of concessions. Uh, they can live in the West Bank, they can live in Gaza, it will coexist. I mean, this is just not to understand the, the ideology. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what it says. Okay, every inch of Palestine, that includes Tel Aviv, that includes uh, every, every part of uh, what they call Palestine. Okay, so that's Article 6. It, it repeats itself. Okay, so uh, I'll just do it briefly. Uh, 11, 11 and 15. Um, the Islamic resistance uh, movement believes that the land of Palestine is an Islamic waqf, meaning an Islamic um, um, possession, I guess, like holy possession. Um, I'm sure there's a better translation for that. Okay, but uh, that's uh, that's the waqf is a, something that was dedicated uh, uh, to the good of Allah. Okay, so uh, that's uh, what's going on here consecrated for future Muslim generations until Judgment Day, okay? So this is their rhetoric, okay? The land of Palestine is Islamic. A, article 15 conveys pretty much the same idea. A, the day that the enemies, uh, a, us, a US part of Muslim land, ah, I'm not sure what this word is, Anyway, jihad becomes the individual duty. Okay, so when the enemies of Islam are basically taking parts of the Muslim lands, you don't need the permission from the ruler or the imam to go for jihad, meaning for war, holy war, uh, for the betterment uh, of the faith. You just go. It becomes the individual duty of every Muslim. Okay, in the face of the Jews' uh, absorption uh, of Palestine, it is compulsory that the banner of jihad be raised. Okay? Meaning, when you see those lone wolves uh, stabbing here, stabbing there, um, running, ram ramming people with cars, all that, that's the uh, individual duty. Okay? The individual duty. So, uh, again, it's a whole Islamic uh, understanding that uh, if there is a, let's say, uh, the Muslim Empire, it's the job of the leader, of the king of that Muslim Empire, of the Sultan, of the Khalifa, the Khalif, the Khalif, the, the Caliphate, okay? It's his rule to lead the jihad efforts against the enemies. But when there is no Muslim Empire, the last one was uh, the Ottoman Empire, when you don't have that, then it's the individual's uh, duty. Okay, that's what you see here, including women, by the way. Um, okay, let's uh, jump uh, to 28. 28. Uh, again, this is all interesting, but uh, just pointing out uh, just a few. The Zionist invasion uh, is a vicious uh, invasion. It does not refrain from uh, resorting to all methods, using all evil and Contempt, contemptible ways, uh, contemptible ways to achieve its ends. It relies greatly in its infiltration and espionage uh, operations on the secret organizations it gave rise to, such as the Freemasons, the Rotary, and Lions Club. I, I assume that you didn't think that uh, they will blame them, but uh, yes, they are here, and other sabotage groups. All these organizations, whether secret or open, work in the interest of Zionism and according to its instructions. They aim to undermining a societies, destroying values, corrupting uh, consciousness, uh, conscience, consciousness, uh, deteriorating uh, character, and annihilating Islam. So if you didn't understand why this war is so bad in general, like for many years, the conflict is so bad, this is why they see the, just the presence of Israel here as all of that, okay? It is behind the drug trade and alcoholism in all its kinds, so as the, to facilitate its control and expansion, okay? So, uh, of course. Arab countries surrounding Israel are asked to open their borders before the fighters from among the Arab and Islamic nations so that they could 
consolidate their efforts with those of their Muslim brethren in Palestine. As for the Arab and Islamic countries, they are asked to facilitate the movement of the fighters from, uh, from and to it, and this is the least thing they could do. We should not forget to remind every Muslim that, uh, that when the Jews uh, conquered the holy city in 1967, Jerusalem, they stood on the uh, threshold of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and proclaimed that Muhammad is dead and his descendants are all women. I, I'm just not familiar with Moshe Dayan doing that or anything, but whatever. Israel, Judaism, and Jews challenge Islam and the Muslim people. May the cowards never sleep. Right? And it goes on and on. But uh, again, just want to highlight a few uh, of the articles. I think you should um, just check it and just read it. Again, just educate yourself about the conflict in not through me, for, not, yeah, not from news. News are just uh, talking heads that um, uh, won't really educate you much. It's very superficial for the most part. Just educate about, educate yourself about the conflict, small doses at the time, and uh, that's it. So uh, that's what I want to share with you uh, tonight. Uh, tonight, my time. Um, yes, your uh, noon or afternoon. And uh, if there are any uh, questions, then uh, you're welcome to ask. Itamar? Go ahead. Hi, this is Karen. I'm Erez's mother in law. I know, I know. I don't Once know you said Karen, I knew. It's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, in listening to that, um, I always thought that not all Muslims were bad, but based on that, does that mean all Muslims are against Jewish people? Um, okay, let me just, um, I said that, but just to understand the framework of Islam, okay, is that everyone should come under Islam. Jews and Christians can live under Islam as second-class citizens. It's called dhimmi, okay? That's how it's called. It's like a whole category in Islam of what they can do, what they don't do, uh, all kinds of taxes they are obligated to pay. Don't ask. It's like very elaborate. Just so you understand, like, being a dhimmi, okay, being these second-class citizens under Islamic uh, and Muslim countries, this is something that my family experienced, okay? So both of my grandparents, they had to flee from Yemen because otherwise they will be converted to Islam because both my, my grandfather, he lost his dad, he was an orphan and therefore he was supposed to be kidnapped by Muslim families and raised as a Muslim. Same thing goes with my uh, grandmother. They both had to flee um, uh, Yemen in the 1920s and 1930s, otherwise they'll, they'll be forcibly converted to Islam and that's it, see? so. It's not something theoretical. This is something that many Israelis that are coming from uh, uh, Muslim countries originally, uh, Sephardic and others, okay, Zerachi Jews. Um, this is something that we experienced, okay, in Morocco, in uh, Iraq, and other places. Um, okay. Karen Itamar, can I interrupt that's for the, one second that's on the, the same subject? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. In other words, the Jews who lived in all the Arab countries until 1948 were considered second-class citizens, even though they were welcome to live there. Say it again. Where was it? All, all the Jews until 1948. No, 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 no. Okay. Because there was like a whole constellation, uh, which was the British mandate. So oh, okay. if it's the British mandate, there was no Islamic rule here. So you could say that until 1917, when the Ottomans were here, yes, that was the... Oh, no, 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 Itamar, I'm not talking about in Israel. I'm talking about if they lived in Morocco. Ah, okay. In, ah, yes, yes. In Iraq, if they Correct. lived in... Right, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so yes and no, uh, because some countries were forced to uh, change their policies against minorities uh, in the mid 19th century onwards, basically. So at least on the outside, 
uh, Jews and Christians were allowed to be equal like anyone else, but the the Muslims living in these it, but it was because the rulers decide that. Don't ask. It has to look, to do a lot with the uh, European imperialism, the these like rulers of Egypt and North Africa and Ottoman Empire. They kind of had to have these concessions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European uh, superpowers. So at least on the legal aspect of it, in the empires, in these different Muslim countries, uh, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, there was this equality. Okay. Uh, I don't want to get to the Turkish terms of it, but anyway, no, I'll, no, no. But I'll, I'll just say that I'll just say that yes, there was the veneer that yeah, they are equal, but the regular Muslim on the street would never allow that. You see, would never allow the the uh, Jews and the Christians to kind of boast against boast against him. Like how? Like no, he's a he's a dhimmi. He's supposed to uh, pay me the jizya. He's supposed to do that. He's supposed to to do this. So. Um, there was tension going on between the elites of these countries and the common people. Okay, so that's that's what I can say about it. Karen, so, thank uh, you just for asking. Karen, that uh, yeah, just Karen to to say uh, something about it. Uh, but wait, I'm think... still confused. I know you're confused <laughs> because I gave you Amer the... American oh, American yeah, exactly. Muslim. Mm -hmm. I I I thought that it was. I don't know. My, I just thought that it was the extremists of of the Muslims that were like the Hamas, but that the Muslim people were basically a um, more like more like Jewish belief, more 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 peaceful. But no, all Muslims. No, I, generalizing. I, yeah. So look, I'm. It's a different situation for them because they are a minority under non-Muslim country in non-Muslim countries. Okay, so there are I know about Europe because it was like a part of my thesis, uh, but um, I'm not sure about America. I assume that in America you have pockets like that, but uh, in different parts of Europe there there are very devoted Muslims that say that uh, yes we are minorities in these European countries, but we still possess this belief, we still hold this belief in mainstream Islam, that one day the entire world will come under the Sharia law and people will convert to Islam and those who are Christians or Jews, they will have to live as dhimmi class, okay, the second class uh, citizens designated to the people of the book, okay. So they hold this belief. I, I assume that the average Muslim that just lived his life in America and uh, is not very religious, I guess. Uh, maybe they know about it, but they don't, they change their value system, you see? Um, but, but just like Jews, we have holy scriptures, we have our scriptures, we have our Jewish law. It's there, it's always there. So one day they will go to a mosque after, I don't know, someone will pass away and they just want to get comfort in, uh, and learn about the Muslim law and all that. This is what they're going to encounter because that's what their literature says. Will they, whether they will embrace it or not, it just depends on the person, okay? But this is, that's what the books are saying, okay? Okay, okay, I... I, I by the way, I started this with Deuteronomy 25 that speaks about the commandment of the Jewish people to commit this genocide against the Amalekites, okay? so. I'm not, I'm just, I'm showing you that I'm trying to be uh, kind of fair here, but I'm just showing you that this literature exists in our uh, Bible as well. Okay. To fight the pure evil, basically, to fight the Amalekites. So I know it's shocking, but I'm just... Um, I yes, because I, I, I did not think that they basically were, had this evil belief all the time, but I, I, I understand. Uh, let me just. Um, we do too in the Torah. We do too from the beginning of time. What? What do you mean? Where you destroy your enemy. No, Amalekites is something special. Like this is a very it's unique very genocide. special, right? It's a, right, it's a, right. It's a very exceptional kind of commandment. But I, I'll just say that um, 
the Jewish people, unlike uh, Islam and uh, Christian, at least Christianity, until somewhere in the, I guess, 1700s or so or 1800s, um, Jews are not missionaries. Okay, meaning we do believe that the 70 nations should exist, each nation on its land. We're not imperialist in that sense. Okay, uh, we don't try to convert. We're not trying to uh, expand the territories more than what was promised. And the idea of Judaism is that uh, other nations um, uh, will see the, the law of Moses being exercised by the Jews and the, the society that is built under the, these uh, scriptures, okay? And uh, they'll be inspired by that and they'll come to visit. So the whole celebration of Sukkot is all about that, the book of Zechariah speaks about it, about the nations coming to Jerusalem. Isaiah 2 also speaks about the, the nations of the world coming to Jerusalem to learn uh, the word of God in Jerusalem. So there is no imperialistic thought in Judaism. Uh, pretty much, we're pretty much against it. In Islam, everything should come under Islam. So there's one God, there's one Sharia, at least theoretically. One Sharia, meaning one law, Islamic law, one prophet, okay, etc., etc. So everyone should be under that, uh, that's their paradigm, basically, and not in Judaism. So that's the difference. So they don't like Christians either, Muslims? It's not so much about liking, it's just the status of Vimmi, uh, D-H-I-M-I, -I, okay, Vimmi, uh, the status of it applies to Jews and Christians. Second class citizens under Islam. So that's what Hamas says. Hamas says, basically, Yes, the Jews could live under the Islamic uh, country. No problem. We're very tolerant. In their eyes, they're actually tolerant. If you believe the way they I don't know what believe. you do with that, to be honest, but uh, okay. If but you are in other the words, way they believe. Hmm? In other words, anybody who's not Muslim. Yes, not everyone who's not Muslim. No, Buddhists. No. Shinto, what do you do with them? I don't know. What do they do with them? They have to convert. Right. Uh, okay. Because they are, they are in the category of uh, of uh, kufar, meaning they are non-believers that are actually. There's another term. It's called mushrik. It means it mean it means that they are. They have multiple gods, or they um, have the one right. god they're not, plus, they're not the plus other deities. Oh yeah, okay. exactly. So they don't believe okay. in one god, or they believe in that one god plus all kinds of other deities around it. So anyway, they uh, they're they allow the Jews and Christians to have their faith, uh, but as second class citizens, but as far as, you know, I guess idol worshippers or pagans, again, that's that I'm trying to use the terminology that uh, you're familiar with. Uh, they have to convert to Islam, basically. But I have one other question. How? So, so the, the Hamas don't take care of their own people, though. They don't, I mean, if Israel supplies electricity and Israel supplies food and Israel supplies health care on in the Gaza, Hamas, um, and they use Hamas uses their own people as human shields, and and the Hamas don't protect their people. So they're not even protecting their own people that believe in. In, in their Muslim belief, correct? So what's the, I mean, I know you can't answer. No, but... it's true, I answer. That's exactly what happens. I mean, if they would care about the future of their children, they won't indoctrinate them into jihadi ideology because jihadi ideology leads to the situation Gaza in, is in right now, okay? Because if you only brainwash the children, the younger generation, that the Jews are to be blamed for this, the Jews are to be blamed for that, well, they, they must be annihilated, they took our land, they took our villages, we have to get it back, then they, they idolize, you know, their uh, martyrs, etc, etc. Like, this is how people live over there. So, I mean, um, I'm sure there are great people in Gaza, I'm sure there are artists, in, I've seen actually, artists in Gaza, I'm sure there are great people over there, but this is the framework in which they work and in which they live. So, um, uh, yeah, so definitely Habas takes care of their people. They are a country, they're a de facto country, okay? Um, 
but uh, um, but they also have the ideological part of jihad against Israel that they cannot let go. See, so that's why we see these bursts of bursts of uh, violence every year or two. I have another question, okay. and this might just be because I don't understand again. So Palestinians, who are they? Where are they? What do they call Palestine? And what do they call Israel Palestine? Yeah. So, so These are, the Palestinians are the Arabs that lived here um, a, during like the Ottoman Empire and the British mandate, basically. Like so I'm they, talking about, so, I'm talking about the areas that we call Israel, basically, with, with the exception of the Golan Heights, pretty much. So they live among Israel, and they just call their they just call Israel Palestine, where we call it we we call it Israel. Pretty much. And Again, I don't want to dive too deep into that, but uh, what I just let me know what's your question. So, are Palestinians good or bad? I'm I'm talking about the ideology that is so destructive. Okay, so so is it the so what is their ideology? I, I just showed you the the Hamas charter, so it's pretty obvious. So, they, that... so they're so are Palestinians um, Muslim? Most of the Palestinians are Muslims. We, they have uh, Christians I guess that's too. my question. Yeah, so okay. most of the Palestinians are Muslims. Uh, they have uh, Christians too. From all different Christian denominations, but yes. So they li they live among the Jewish people under Jewish law. Uh, we will just really go off the track here. So I'll I'll just um, I'll I'll say this, and then we'll conclude. And I'll just have to use an uh, again one of the other sessions for that. So I'll be happy. No, no, no. I just like I'm like in my mind because I'm a mess here. Um, who's good, who's bad, and I know it's uh, not black and white like that. <laughs> so, uh, really quick, okay? And I really won't, don't, don't want to go off the rails here. But I'll just say that the Palestinians, the Arabs that lived here until the independence war, 1948, okay? Uh, they are the ones that are called Palestinians and their descendants, they call themselves Palestinians, okay? So even if they are in Lebanon in some refugee camp or in Jordan, etc., they still call themselves Palestinians. Okay, it's like the Jewish diaspora, basically. So they have the Palestinian diaspora. Okay, so we have a situation that it's one nation. It's a, as Jews, we are actually familiar with that. Okay, but they have a situation that we have uh, Palestinians living under Israel as Israeli citizens. We have Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip under Hamas. We have Palestinians living in the West Bank. And we have Palestinians living in the diaspora, whether it's Arab countries around us or America or wherever, okay, Europe, they can live everywhere. So um, when you say the Palestinian people, uh, I'm not sure about the numbers. I want to say 10 million people. Like if you count all of them in Israel and the diaspora, I, probably I'm not too far from it. I didn't check, but uh, 10 to 15 million sounds about right, okay? Um, so uh, these are what we call Palestinians. And they have, you know, just like Jews, we have Jews in Canada, in Russia, in Australia, they, each one has his own opinion and kind of like identity and all that. So, uh, yeah, I hope uh, I got you a little more organized on that. But uh, I don't want to follow up question for that. No, no, because... no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay, Karen. But we'll, don't, that's why I'm doing these sessions for Q&A because I'm trying to... And I, I appreciate it. it. I greatly appreciate it. Okay, welcome. I, I always say when we educate ourselves, small doses, then we let it sink. We kind of, it will take time to fully understand. But, uh, Tamar, yeah. Siri says there's 14 million Palestinians in the world. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. I told you, you 10 go. to 15 sounds about right. Yeah. I'm not sure how many of these 10 to 15 that Siri talks about uh, are actually identified as Palestinians because sometimes they have, um, especially if they're Christians, you know, they have. Uh, um, Lebanese father and the Palestinian mother. So I, I'm not sure exactly how they count it. But anyway, just um, just a thought. Uh, let's see the chat. Uh, can you say something about the Jewish refugees from Arab world in 1940s, 50s? Uh, Chris, this is a very interesting topic. As a, a person that his uh, family came from uh, Morocco and Yemen, 
uh, I will, I'm quite familiar with it, uh, but not now. It's a pretty big topic, uh, so we'll keep it for uh, for the future. Palestine name comes from the Roman name for the territory. Um, Janelle, uh, the name Palestine derives from the Bible, Philistine, Philistines, okay? It's like the Greek nation that lived here. And um, the Greek and the Romans kind of kept that name against the Jews. Caesar Adrian actually named the province of Judea, the province of Palestine, uh, after the, uh, the second um, Jewish revolt against Rome. And um, that's where the name is from. So the name Palestine, Philistine in Arabic, uh, derives from the Bible, but the Palestine, not the Palestine, the Philistines of the Bible has nothing to do with the Arab Muslims that we have today. They were okay. Greek origin. Okay, they're, they're, they're literally from Crete and the Greek islands and all that. Okay, we know that. Like we just know there who the people are. So uh, we have it in there. We just see in the archaeology. We know where they are from. So the Philistines that, I don't know, Goliath the giant fighting David, okay, all that. He's not Arab Muslim, okay? It's like way before Islam came about. Uh, but the name kind of passed on from generation to generation by the Greek um, Empire and later by the Roman Empire until this day. Okay, so this is where it's coming from. Okay, thank you for joining. I know there are like, it's very hard on these sessions to know how much you should put in, like how many subjects you want to touch. I was not sure if I want, I, I just wanted to show you the Hamas charter, but I wasn't sure if I'll do it today or some other day, but um, glad we did it. Uh, but yeah, it opens a lot of questions. It's all very interesting, uh, but I just want to expose you to um, the conflict in a mild way, not the actual graphics that uh, are on the news and social media, but just want you to be familiar with what's underlining, uh, what is under this whole thing. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, joining. Thank you. Thank you very much, Itamar. Okay. Thank All you very much. And uh, I'm not sure about tomorrow, but we'll have more sessions like that. I'll let you know, okay? Take care. Good night. Be safe. All the safe. best. Bye-bye.